The Alan Young Show. Featuring our singing star, Diane Courtney, the music of Peter Van Steeden, and starring Alan Young. Well, let's get started with the program. First, I want to have a whole bunch of... Come in, if you're funny. Mr. Young, I'm Leonard T. Holton of the Ajax Phonograph Record Company. Since this is your first broadcast of your new series, perhaps you'd like to have a phonograph record made of it. Oh, do you make phonograph records of radio broadcasts? Why, certainly. Huh. We've made phonograph records for some of the biggest, 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 some of the biggest. Wait a second. Your Adam's apple is caught in your dicky. <laughs> now start again and take it easy. Well, as I was saying, uh, we've made phonograph records for some of the greatest radio stars like uh, Kate Smith, Bob Hope, Burns and Allen, Diana Shaw, Charlie McCarthy, Lowell Thomas, Eddie Cantor, H.B. Carlton. Wait a second. Let me wind you up here. Racy Allen, Ed Gardner, Lawrence Tibbet, Ed Wynn, and hundreds of other famous radio stars. Why, we've made records of... Ow! 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 Mr. Holton, what happened? The needle reached the end. Good day, Mr. Young. That guy's whole family's been in the phonograph business. When he was a baby, his mother bought him an automatic changer. But, uh... Now to, now to get back to my program, the first thing I want to do is get a... Come in. Hello, Mr. Young. I'm so glad to see you. I am, I am, I am. Well, sit down, sit down, sit down. I think I know you. I've seen your picture someplace. Really? Where? On a bottle of iodine. <laughs> oh, Mr. Young, you're so droll. You are, you are, you are. Well, gee, I like the way you talk. One early show and two repeats for the West Coast. <laughs> what's, your, what's your name again? Uh, Harriet Hatch. Harriet Hatch, from the booby of the same name. <laughs> No, Mr. Young. I have my own little program on this network. Harriet Hatch and her new sea nugget for Happy Housewives. Oh, that's a great program. I understand that over 50% of your listeners are people. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, it's a lovely program, dear boy. Yes. And it's sponsored by the makers of Mother Magruder's chocolate covered meatballs. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I know Mother Magruder's chocolate covered meatballs. They're delicious. They melt right in your pocket. <laughs> but that isn't all. A lot of foods contain iron. But these are the only meatballs that contain stainless steel. <laughs> Here, try one, won't you? No, thanks. Oh, I insist, I insist, I insist. Well, no, all right, all right, all right. Fine. Just pop it into your mouth. That's it. Now swallow it. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, if it hit all my ribs, my eyes would light up. <clears throat> now, Miss Hatch, if you excuse me, I have to do uh, a few things. Mr. Young, I want you to do a guest appearance on my program. Huh? I promised my listeners that I'd bring them your life story. Oh, my life hasn't been very interesting. Oh, yes, it has. I already know a few things about you. For instance, do you listeners know that today is Alan Young's birthday? <laughs> Wait a minute, Miss Hatch. Today isn't my birthday. I know. Well, then why do you say it is? I love to hit applause. Oh. <laughs> and now I'll run out and get a pad and pencil, and then you must tell me everything about yourself. You must, you must, you must. Kenny, what did I let myself in for? That woman's going to take up the rest of the program interviewing me. Oh, she can't, Alan. She can't. She can't. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's our charming singing star, Diane Courtney, to sing for us the trolley song. With my high starched collar and my high top shoes and my hair piled high upon my head, I went to lose a jolly hour on the trolley and lost my heart instead. With his light brown derby and his bright green tie He was quite the handsomest of men I started to yell So I counted to ten Then I counted to ten Again The 
trolley. Ding, ding, ding went the bell. Ding, ding, ding went my heart string. For the moment I saw him, I fell. Chug, chug, chug went the motor. Bump, bump, bump went the brake. Thump, thump, thump went my heart string. When he smiled, I could feel the car shake. He tipped his hat and took a seat. He said he hoped he hadn't stepped upon my feet. He asked my name. I held my breath. I couldn't speak because he scared me half to death. Buzz, buzz, buzz went the buzzer. Plop, plop, plop went the wheel. Stop, stop, stop went my heart string. As he started to leave, I took hold of his sleeve with my hand, and as if it were planned, he stayed on with me, and it was grand just to stand with his hand holding mine to the end of the. was fine, Diane. You're a wonderful singer. And I want you to feel that from now on, you're one of the family on our show. Oh, that's very sweet of you, Alan. Oh, not at all. And by the way, I guess you'll never dream that while you were out here singing, I'd, I'd fill your dressing room full of orchids and gardenias. Well? Yes? I didn't. <laughs> now, if there's anything else I can do for you, I'll uh, be pleased... Young, are you ready to tell me your life story? Oh, it's you, Miss Hatch. I thought you went out to have your bustle retreaded. Now, where should I begin my life story? At the beginning, I guess. Well, I was born in 1920, the year of the Great Depression. There was no depression in 1920. There was in my house. When they saw me, everybody was depressed. But to continue, not many people know this, but I have a twin sister. She's eight years older than I am. Well, Mr. Young, how could she be eight years older than you are? She forced herself. (laughs) But to return to my childhood, we were very poor in those days, Miss Hatch. I remember my father would stand by the furnace hour after hour, blowing cigar smoke up the chimney to make the neighbors think we had coal. (laughs) Oh, my father. I'll never forget the day he called me into his room and said to me, Hello, son. Uh, hello, Dad. I always called him Dad as a mark of respect. (laughs) After all, he was old enough to be my father. (laughs) What is it, Dad? Uh, Son, I want to have a little chat with you man to man. Uh, how old are you, son? Seventeen. Seventeen. My, my. When I was your age, I was twenty. <laughs> well, Miss Hatch, obviously there was nothing left for me to do but leave home. So I packed my shirt, my tie, and my 300 Tommy Dorsey records, <laughs> and I went out into the world. It was then that I met Bertha. A girl? How many boys do you know named Bertha? (laughs) What a girl she was. Tall and willowy. Willowy. She had skin like the bark of a tree. I loved Bertha, even though she had a broken nose by a previous marriage. But our our romance soon came to an end. Oh, Mr. Young, that's a sad story. My heart goes out to you. Ah, put it back! Oh, I see. Oh, I'm sorry. But... But life wasn't all sadness and tears, Miss Hatch. One day, a bright note crept in. That was it. I was 23 years old. Time for my first pair of long pants. And do you know, do you know where I bought them? Where? I put on my beanie and my bobby socks and hurried right down to Breen Bracker's department store. Oh, Mr. Breenbracker. Mr. Breenbracker. Oh, here I am. You would have to walk in now. Were you doing something important, Mr. Breenbracker? Yes, and I was in the back of the store taping up an old bat. You were? Yes, my wife's always spraining her ankle. (laughs) 
What do you want? Well, Mr. Greenberger, I'm 23 years old today, and I'm going to buy something that'll change the whole course of my life. Guess what? A new ribbon for your midi blouse? <laughs> don't be silly, Mr. Greenberger. I don't wear a midi blouse. I'm a man. Don't say that so loud. You'll discourage the rest of our sex. <laughs> Now, do you want to buy something, or can I go back and finish ironing my Snuggies? Well, I'm, I'm going to buy something, Mr. Greenbacker. Today, I'm going to buy my first pair of long pants. Goody. The next thing you know, you'll be going out with girls. Oh. I'm not interested in girls. Would you say that again? I said, I'm not interested in girls. Blondie, I want to have a little talk with you. <laughs> Sit down. All right. Did you ever see a copy of Esquire? Certainly. Well? They have some very interesting articles. The interview is over. <laughs> Mr. Breenbreaker, what are you trying to tell me? Forget it. I'm a very busy man today. I'm painting my wife's picture. Gee, I didn't know you were an artist. I'm not. But you said you were painting your wife's picture. I'm painting it black. I can't stand the sight of her. No, <laughs> Lee. Wait, let, let's get back to the subject of girls again. Huh. Kid, uh, do you know about the birds and the bees? What have they got to do with anything? Oh, I'm cheating some psychiatrist out of a good case. <laughs> Let me put it this way. When I was your age, I'd never gone out with girls either. But then one day I met my wife, Emily, and a strange feeling came over me. Love? No, nausea. <laughs> Well, uh, how did you happen to marry her, Mr. Greenbacker? Mm, just one of those things, kid. We went around with each other for a while, and then one night I proposed to her in a garage. And I couldn't back out. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting, Mr. Greenbacker, but I came in here for a pair of long mm, pants. Oh, okay. Come on into the pants department. Gee, Mr. Breenbracker, this window here looks out on your backyard, doesn't it? Don't lean out of that window, kid. The pulley's broken and the window's liable to come down on your head. Oh, it's perfectly safe. I want to look out and see your garden. Don't stick your head out of there. That window will fall down and fracture your skull. Don't be silly. How can a big window like this fall down when it's fast? Oh! I'm glad. <laughs> Now, come on over here and look at these pants. Here, here's a pair that'll just fit you. Gee, they're nice. How much are they? They're $139. <laughs> Gee, the, the pants' legs are kind of tight. I can't get my feet into them. Grease your ankles. <laughs> now, this, this pair over here looks better. I'll take these. They're $18. I'll take them. Don't make up your mind right away. Go home and talk it over with your patrol leader. <laughs> Don't have to talk it over with anybody. I'll take these, wrap them up. Okay. Here you are, and I hope you're happy with them. Gee, I'll never forget my first pair of long pants. They were purple with light green stripes and four-inch cuffs. The minute I walked out of the house, everybody started laughing. Why? I forgot to put them on. Oh, <laughs> good day, Mr. Brady. Good day, Mr. And he was my first meeting with Mr. Breenbacker. And you know, to this day, he never wants to sell me anything. Well, that's certainly a switch. Most shopkeepers are anxious to sell their stuff when they have it. Not Mr. Breenbacker. Why, he wouldn't even sell me a, a ferry boat. Well, how do you know he has a ferry boat? He must have. Last time I saw him, his slip was showing. <laughs> I'll always be near you 
Story. You must tell me more about your background. All right, Miss Hatch. There weren't any brilliant minds in my family. The Youngs were a proud lot, but they were a vacant lot. <laughs> the day I became 21, I realized it was time for me to go to work. After all, I couldn't make adolescence my career. I decided to go into radio. My first job was with a local station in town. This station was owned by Mr. Little, and Mr. Little used to let me tinker around in the control room. <laughs> Little Tinker, the boys used to call me. <laughs> then I decided to try to get a job with one of the networks. <sighs> Gee, what a big radio station this is. I wonder where I go to get a job. There's so many doors. Let's see the signs on these doors. Technical men, control men, production men... Men? <laughs> What's this next one? Audition room. I'll go and see if I can get myself an audition. I'm busy. Whatever it is, slip it under the door. Okay. <coughs> it's a tight squeeze, but I made it. <laughs> well... What can I do for you? Uh, sir, I'm a comedian. I'd like to get a program of my own. All right. Step over to the microphone and tell me a joke. Well, gee, I... gosh. I don't know. Oh, my boy, don't be nervous. Huh? I'm your friend. We need comedians. I want you to succeed. I want to help you. I want to give you every chance in the world. Hmm. Now, go ahead. Tell your joke. Yeah. Well, it seems that Pat met Mike one day. <laughs> Trusting soul, wasn't he? <laughs> Hatch, I finally talked him into giving me a job. The leading role in the station's most popular dramatic program. What a show that was. It was called Young Dr. Young. The thrilling story of a young doctor named Young Dr. Young. Played by Young Dr. Young, who was a doctor and young. <laughs> doctor? Which, uh, which was why they called the story of Young Dr. Young, Young Dr. Young. Uh, how did that go again? It uh, doesn't make any difference. In the radio section of the newspaper, the program was listed as racing results. <laughs> Oh, that first episode. I'll never forget it. Presenting another thrilling chapter in that exciting dramatic serial, Young Dr. Young. As the story opens, we find young Dr. Young in the hospital corridor. Calling Dr. Young. Calling Dr. Young. You should hear what they're calling Dr. Young. <laughs> Dr. Young wasn't in the operating room. Come, nurse. We're needed in the operating room. Nurse, quick. 
Get me some hot water and a towel. Are you going to operate, Doctor? No, I'm going to take a bath. <laughs> but, Doctor, the operation... I'm ready. Are you? Ready? Mm. Scalpel. Scalpel. Sponge. Sponge. Forceps. Forceps. Suture. Suture. Nurse. Yes. Where's the patient? <laughs> Miss Hatch, as you can readily see, I was making wonderful progress in radio. And I went on from that serial to a big detective program in which I played the part of a famous law enforcement officer, Sheriff Young. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Sheriff Young to tell us about another of his famous cases. Sheriff Young, what would you say was the most exciting case in your career? Well, partner, I remember a case I broke when I was a member of the Texas Rangers. It all started in a little border town. One night it was raining and down by the railroad station. (laughs) That man is now in prison for life. Thank you, Sheriff Young. Mm. that to give me an even bigger program. You may have heard it. The Happy Kitty Hour. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Good morning, kitties. This is your happy Uncle Alan. (laughs) My, what a big spitball. (laughs) Well, anyway, kitties, this is your Uncle Alan. All right, all right. You just bet you... Uncle Alan is brought to you by the makers of Bomb Schnooks Lollipops. 99 and 44 one hundredth percent stick. <laughs> In a scientific laboratory test against seven other leading brands, Bomb Schnooks didn't do so good. <laughs> Remember, Bomb Schnooks is the only lollipop that is guaranteed to make a sucker out of you. <laughs> and Bomb Schnooks come in three handy sizes. All day, half day, and quick drool. <laughs> and don't forget, all bomb schnooks lollipops are pre-licked. <laughs> Kitties, just remember to eat bomb schnooks lollipops and grow up to be a great big... Now, kitties, it's time to... <laughs> it's now time for our mailbag. The first letter here is from little Rodney O'Droopenflop. <laughs> Uncle Alan is very glad to learn that you've been killing all those rats at the city dump, Rodney. But there's really no need to mail them all in to Uncle Alan. <laughs> uh, now to get on with the program, here's our first little guest. And what is your name, Sonny? Norman Ditton, Pepper. <laughs> Norman Ditton, Pepper. Well, uh, Norman, will you tell all the mummies and daddies listening in what you think of Uncle Alan's radio program? Can I ask you a question? Uh, yes. What does an elephant do with its trunk? It smells. <laughs> oh. oh, I see. Well, Norman, for your bright answer, Uncle Alan is going to give you a bomb schnooks lollipop. Stand right up here at the microphone and show everybody how much you enjoy eating it. Go ahead, lick the lollipop. Yes, sir. Mm. Well, don't stand around, everybody. Let's bury the kid. <laughs> Well, Miss Hatch, so far in my radio career, I had done everything but comedy. But now I suppose you want to know how I got one of my first comedy programs. Well, it happened this way. It was in the year 1938, almost two years ago now. I went up, uh, I went up to an office one day and knocked at the door. Uh, Mr. Grotney, my name is Alan Young. I'd like to do a program for you people. Get out. But, Mr. Grotney... Get out of here, you stupid, fish-faced, hammer-headed, moronic, undernourished idiot. Undernourished? (laughs) Mr. Grotney, I I want to go on the air for you. Do you think that we give programs out to any jerk that walks into this office? 
Mr. Grotney, were you in Hackensack, New Jersey in April 1941? Do you think we give valuable air time? Hackensack? April 1941. Why, yes. Remember that red-headed manicurist named Gladys? <laughs> Starting tomorrow, you have your own program, and good luck to you, my boy. Good night, brother the static. <laughs> It was just one of those things Just one of those crazy things One of those bells that now and then ring Just one of those things It was just one of those nights Just one of those fabulous nights A trip to the moon Gosh, the ring Just one of those things If we thought a bit Of the end of it When we started painting the town We'd have been aware That our love affair Was you Not to prove us So goodbye Dear and dear On behalf of Diane, Kim, Peter, and myself, in fact, all of us, we want to thank you for being with us tonight. Radio service.